So a few months ago, uh, I was watching TV and a commercial came on. You probably have seen this commercial. It's a commercial for an insurance company. The commercial was this. Two raccoons stole a garbage truck, drove it down an alley, and then that was about it. All right? And then the logo comes up. And I've seen that a couple of times. I'm sure you've seen it. I don't think much about it. I've seen it a few times. And then like the third or fourth time I see it, raccoon, steal a garbage truck, driving it down crazy. I noticed at the very end of the commercial, these words popped up on the bottom of the screen. Professional drivers on a closed course do not attempt. And I thought to myself, one of two things. They either think that I'm gullible enough to think that they train professional <laughs> raccoon stunt drivers or that I'd be so inspired by these professional raccoons that I too would go out and steal a garbage truck and drive it down an alley. And I thought, either way, I'm the fool in this. Now, I share that with you. Now, I don't think anybody in this room or watching is going to go out and steal a garbage truck because you're inspired by raccoons. But however, I think we've made decisions that we look back, or we've seen other people make decisions and go, man, that was just foolish. And that was unwise. Why in the world are they doing that? And so for the next four weeks, We'll be going through the book of Proverbs, and you can sum up the book of Proverbs in one word, and the, and the word is wisdom. And it's this idea that there is a plan and a path, and there is a right and a wrong path for our lives, and this wonderful book of wisdom God gives us to instill like things about how to manage money and friends and decisions and major leadership things that you wrestle with is found in the book of Proverbs. So if you've got a Bible, grab it, go to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, and while you're turning there, wisdom is one of those words that's kind of squishy to define, but I read a great definition this week, and it's this. Wisdom isn't something theoretical. It's something very practical that affects every area of life. It gives order and purpose to life. It gives discernment in making decisions, and it provides a sense of fulfillment in life to the glory of God. So you understand that wisdom is a real, tangible thing. It's not a theoretical thing. It's not an ethereal thing. It's something that you and I can grasp. It's what helps us make the right decisions and go down the right path and answer the questions in the right way and understanding that there is godly wisdom available to you and to me. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1, it kicks it off. It says, these are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. Their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline and to help them understand the insights of the wise. Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives, to help them do what is right, just, and fair. These proverbs will give insight to the simple knowledge and discernment to the young. Let the wise listen to these proverbs and become even wiser. Let those with understanding receive guidance by exploring the meaning in these Proverbs and parables, the words of the wise and their riddles. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. And what Solomon is writing is like that, that there is a right path and there, there is a wrong path. And godly wisdom, it helps you navigate life with success and purpose. And so life is not this random series of events that you and I kind of bumble our way through, or we hope this happens, or we'd hope this happens. There is a right path, and there is a wrong path. And as believers, as followers of Jesus, the right path is available to us through this wisdom, through godly wisdom, to understand how do we navigate difficult things? How do we navigate hard choices? How do we navigate tough decisions? How do we navigate managing money? How do we navigate difficult conversations with friends? How do you and I make sure we are on the right path? not the wrong path. And God has designed life with order and with purpose, and he's the ultimate creator. And so to understand that it's not just this random series of events, but that there is a creator in mind that says, I designed you and created you with a purpose. And if you would study my word and get wisdom into your life, into your heart, you will walk down the life of path, uh, the path of, of success and, and purpose and fulfillment. And so the question is, do you and I really understand what the creator says? Because when you understand what the creator says about life, it completely changes it. Like when you view life as just like you're a human being, you're born, you live, you work, you retire, you buy a boat, and then you die. Like if that's how you view life, then it's just this random thing, well, I hope it works, I hope it doesn't. But if you go, man, that there is a creator, that there is a God of the universe, and you're made in his image, and there's a plan and a purpose, it changes everything. 
Then all of a sudden you're going, oh, there, there is a reason why I was born with this skill set. There is a reason why I moved here. There is a reason why I took this job. There is a reason why we moved to this area. There is reason and a plan and purpose when you understand the creator's design behind it. My best friend back in Texas that Brianna and I have been friends with their family for almost 15 years. My best friend is uh, in the tech space. And so for the past 15 years, he has built mobile apps. So long before the App Store became the App Store, he was building things for like little Windows mobile devices and moved the App Store. And so he's built things in the medical space and in the oil and gas space and in the virtual reality space and in the film editing space. And he's just spent his career doing that. And he's just this super smart guy. But to talk to him and listen to him and then to operate the app that he built is a very different experience. And so if you've ever talked to the developer, the creator, I've, I've used his apps and it's fun to go to him and go, why in the world did you do this? And he'll give me like the hundred step process that it took to get there. Well, Chris, moving that button over there is a lot harder than you think. It's like, you know, hours and hours of code. And, and when he would describe, here's why we built the app this way and here's how it's designed to use, it changed my experience how I used it. If you've ever downloaded an app, you're going, why in the world is it this way? This doesn't make sense. But if you talk to the developer, if you talk to the creator of the app, all of a sudden you're going, oh, now it makes sense. Now I see why it's developed this way. Now I see why it's built this way. When you understand that the creator of life has a purpose and a plan, all of a sudden it, it unlocks you going, oh, it's not a random series of events. It's not, man, I hope I get this right. It's, oh, I hope I walk in this place. It's going, there is a right path. And there is a wrong path, and you and I can know the right path for our lives, for our marriage, for our finances, for our future, but it's understanding what the creator says about it. And so the question really then is, on, then how in the world do you know what is the right path to take? Like if, if life is more than just getting a job and retiring and buying a boat and dying, if there's more to life than that, then how do I know if I'm on the right path or the wrong path? And the answer is found probably in the two famous verses that you all know, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 on the next page. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Now, I'm confident you've heard those verses. I'm confident you've seen them on a bumper sticker, on a t-shirt, on a bracelet. You've seen them somewhere. And you probably quote them, trust in the Lord with all your heart. But when you understand really what that means, it completely changes things. And now you get to understand, am I on the right path or on the wrong path? And so it's really broken down into two parts. The first part is this, it's trust wholeheartedly. Trust wholeheartedly. And, and, and if I see anybody in this room or any of you watching, do you trust God? You're going, yeah, 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 I trust God. I trust God. I trust God. But when it says trust, he goes, with my whole heart, with everything I've got. And so here's a question just to, to see if you really trust wholeheartedly. Whatever it is you've got going on, a decision at work, a family issue you're wrestling with, something big weighing on you that you've got to do, you've got to pull off. Here's my question. If God doesn't intervene in your life, can you still make it happen? Like if God doesn't show up in your life, can you still pull it off? And if the answer to that question is yes, then there's not a wholehearted trust on God. God's a nice side benefit. God's a nice bonus. But if God doesn't show up, I'm still going to make it work. It's not trusting God wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly trusting God is going, God, if you don't show up, I'm flat on my face. Like, if you don't show up, I literally don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. God, if you don't show up in my life and in my heart and in my mind in some incredible way, this is going to go really, really bad for me. I'm going to sit here and drown if you don't show up. But if there's some part of you going, well, God, if you don't show up, I can still pull it off, then you're really sort of leaning on God, but you're really leaning more on your wisdom or on your skill set or on your ability to make it happen. So wholehearted trust is going, God, if you don't show up, this will go bad. Two weeks ago, I took my oldest two sons fishing, and uh, we've got this little boat and uh, it's a little John boat. We don't have a motor, so we just have paddles on it. So we took it up to a lake about an hour north up in Helen. The problem with this boat uh, is that it has had a hole in it. That's a problem if, you, if you're a boat owner. I don't know if you know that or not. You don't want holes in your boat. I go, don't worry about this. I'll fix it. And so I just took a bunch of silicone and just squirted the daylights in this hole. And I was like, got it. So we go up to the lake. We're out there. We get out there early. And if you've ever taken two little boys fishing on a boat... I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's a bit of a test your patience. Is that a good way to do it? All right. 
So we're, I'm getting tangled. So we're out there. We're paddling. We're in the middle of the lake. It's perfect. There's fog rising up. We've got the lines in the water. And then all of a sudden, I feel water on my feet. And all of a sudden, my patch job on this boat had sprung a leak. Not a big leak, mind you, but a leak enough to go, there's water at the bottom of my feet. And so I did what any dad would do. I blamed my oldest son, Daniel. Oh, son, you're getting water in the boat. And he's like, Dad, it's not me. And we look back, and all of a sudden, this water is pouring through there. Now, I did not bring a bucket to bail out water in a boat. And so there's one or two things. Either I've got to find a bucket, which I did not have, or I've got to paddle this whole thing back there and end our fishing trip an hour into it. I didn't want to do either one of them. And so we're looking around, and Daniel and David, did you have anything? Do you have anything? And Daniel, by the grace of God, brought a bucket of worms to fish with. It's this little teeny tiny plastic bucket that he stole from Brianna, filled it up with dirt, and I was like, that's perfect. Dump it out. So we dumped out the worms. We had this little tiny Tupperware dish that we would take turns bailing out water. And we realized that if we leaned this side of the boat, the hole would be out of the water just enough. And we could get about 30 minutes of fishing in, and then it would start to fill it back up. But so about every 15 to 30 minutes, we'd be bailing this water out. But it dawned on me, had we not had this little worm bucket, we'd have been done. We, the boat would either be at the bottom, and that's a bad call to Brianna, or <laughs> the fishing trip's over, and we're going back. So we're going, if this bucket was not here, it would have gone bad for us. And I share that with you because it's the same way. If, if God isn't in your life, and he isn't there then it's going to go bad. It's going to go poorly. And if there's at some point going, God, if you don't show up, I can still make it happen. Then there's a point in your life, there's an area in your, in your heart that is not wholeheartedly trusting him. That word to trust means to literally to fall flat on your face going, God, it is all on you. And I'll just be real honest with you. You want it on God and not on yourself. Man, if it's on you, if it's on me to make this happen, to make success happen, to, man, if it's on you to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and will your way to success, it's not going to go well. So you want to know what the right path is. If, if the path is just you doing your own thing, it might be the wrong path, but the path is going, God, I'm walking this path, and if you don't show up today, I'm talking like this morning, God, if you don't show up in this meeting, it's not going to go well. That is wholeheartedly trusting in Trust in the Lord with all your heart. In the very next verse, he says, seek or search his will in everything that you do. So you trust him going, God, if you don't show up, I don't know what's going what's gonna to happen. So you place your trust in him. But then it says to search. And that word really means to know by seeing or experiencing. To know by seeing. Or, so to know his will in every area of your life. To know his will, to understand, to experience his will in every area of your life. Or in other words, in a comprehensive thing. Search comprehensively in every area of your life. Seek his will in that email that you send, the text that you send, the meeting that you're about to have, the family gathering that you're about to do, the job that you're about to change into, the conversation. Seek his will in every moment and every day. Because what I think we happen is we selectively seek God's will. Well, God, I'm going to seek your will, and should I go to church this morning or not? You kind of know God's answer on that one. But when it comes to God's answer, do I take this job with this promotion, this great thing, but I'm not sure it's great for my family? What is God's will in that? God's will in dealing with difficult family members or difficult neighbors or frustrating things. God, I, I, I know what I really want to do, and I'm not sure I want to seek your will. And so we selectively choose and pick what we want to find God's will or not. But what the proverb says is to search in every area, to search comprehensively in every area of your life. And so what happens is we find our will and we stop looking. And so the question is, is do you really search God's will with every area of your life? A comprehensive look until you find his will. Because what happens is when we don't find his will, we just kind of give up and go, well, I didn't hear it or it didn't go the way we want, so we kind of go about our way. And we wonder why we wind up on the wrong path. How did I end up here? How do I end up in this situation? Why is this relationship this way? And if you replay back one, did you really search and understand his will? Did you really go in God? I want to know your will. I want to know what the creator says about my life and my plan. And my, I really want to know how I'm supposed to operate in life versus I'll figure it out. I hope I get it right. Search comprehensively. Begin to search and look until you find it. And then you wake up the next day and you do the same thing over and over again. Last week, 
uh, with kids at home, uh, they get a lot of interaction with each other. Is that a safe bet? Okay. So we get a lot of uh, refereeing going on as parents. All right. I'm sure you do the same. And so the other night, uh, we had to referee a little bit of a, an issue between our oldest son, Daniel, and David. And Daniel had lost the case to his uh, AirPods. And he comes down, I can't find my AirPod case anywhere. And of course, like a good older brother, he blames his little brother, David. David, he threw it, and I don't know where it went. David's like, I didn't throw it. He goes, I tossed it to you. And so we had, a, we had a referee this back and forth. We're going, where is it? I don't know. It was up in my room, and he threw it. I don't know where it's at. Now, Daniel gets his searching ability from me. So Daniel, it kind of looks about like I do, and can't find it, and just goes, I can't find it. And so that went on for a couple hours that night. Well, you guys got to find it. And then the next morning, the, the fight did not carry over the next morning. And so as parents, you kind of wonder, you know, what happened? Did it resolve? And so the next day, all of a sudden, we see Daniel with his AirPod case. We're like, oh, you, you found it. You resolved it. And he kind of sheepishly he goes, yeah. Where was it? Well, no, it's a funny, funny story. <laughs> somehow, somehow, and I'm not sure how, it wound up in the blanket of the basement of where I was playing PlayStation. So you're telling me it went from the second floor all the way down three floors. And yeah, I don't know how I got there. Well, did you look there? No, I really didn't think to look there, Dad. How'd it get there? I, I'm not quite sure. It's, you search one area of your life and we don't find it. So it's easy to blame somebody else. or easy to go, well, I'm not going to find it. But if you would search comprehensively and understand God's will for your life, then he goes, this is the right path and this is the wrong path. There's a highest and best use for your life. You know, I've seen so many young couples that they start off, you know, strong and all of a sudden like they're a year into marriage or a couple of years into marriage and all of a sudden they're just like their heads are spinning. They don't know what's going on. They got their, their first medical bill or maybe they had their first kid or they lost their first job and all of a sudden what started off strong in romance and love, all of a sudden they're going, man, this is hard work. Man, but if when they understand that man, God has designed marriage and God has designed human beings and how they interact and that there is a plan and a purpose, all of a sudden when you understand that for marriage or work or finances or family issues or family dramas, you'd understand that there is a right path, that there is a wrong path, and that the creator of the universe has designed you and I for a specific path to walk. Now what's interesting is everybody knows Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. It's everywhere. Bumper stickers, t-shirts, whatever. But nobody ever puts verse 7 on there. <laughs> Five and six are awesome. Oh, they make such great like Hallmark cards or, you know, write it in somebody's Bible. But verse 7 is the application of verse 5 and 6. Look, look at verse 7. It says this. It says, don't be impressed with your own wisdom and instead fear the Lord and turn away from evil. That just doesn't make a great like coffee cup verse. <laughs> Don't be impressed with yourself. Turn away from evil. God bless. I know that, but, but that's the, that's it. I mean, that's, to understand it going, are you more impressed with your wisdom or with God's wisdom? Do you, do you have an area of evil in your life that you've allowed to dwell or is it completely turned away and focused on him? And we wonder why we don't know God's plan and purpose for our life. It's because we still entertain evil or we're still pretty impressed with our own selves. We still hurt our elbow, patting ourselves on the back, going, man, that was a great decision. You worked really hard. Look at what you did. Look at what you built. Look at you, all this stuff. And so here's the couple of questions, really, where the rubber meets the road in your life and in mine. The qu first question is this is, are we just a little too impressed with our own wisdom? Are we just a little, like, too impressed with our own selves? Like, as we look around and everything that we've built or we've done or our family or our work or whatever it is, do we hurt our elbow, patting ourselves on the back, going, man, look at all. Are we a little too impressed with our own wisdom? Because what would happen if it was all taken away and would your face really be on the ground before your heavenly father going, Lord, I trust you completely. If you don't show up today, I don't know what's going to happen. Are we just a little too impressed with our own lives? And then the second question is this, and maybe a bit more difficult to answer, but are we willing to be done with evil in our lives? Are we willing to be done with evil? What's interesting is when it says turn away from evil, the original word in the Hebrew, it means to behead which is a very like, what? It just, it means to cut off. It means to be done with. What it means, it doesn't mean is to entertain. 
It doesn't mean to keep an area of your life. And so are we really ready to be done with evil in our life? Or are we still entertaining an area in our mind and in our heart? And it's nothing that you're going to share with me or the people in this room, but it's the thing that you know. It's that temptation that you just have, have not dealt with. It's because it's too painful. It's too embarrassing. It's going to require counseling. It's going to require uh, an email. It's going to require a conversation. It's going to require something that's going to be ugly and painful. So it's just easier to let it be there in your life. And we wonder why we aren't searching completely and finding God's will in our life. Because there's an area of evil that we've yet to cut out. There's an area of evil that we've yet to get rid of. There's something that we're just going, it's way easier just to leave it there. And it festers and it grows and it destroys the rest of our life. And we wake up going, what in the world happened? What happens? We didn't cut off and deal with the evil in our life. And so are you really ready and willing to deal with the evil and cut it out? Or is it just still there? And those things that you know when the Lord goes, this is not right. This needs to be gone. Now, Brianna, as a mom, one of her many awesome roles that she does is she performs minor surgeries on our family. <laughs> and she kind of likes it. And it's just kind of her thing. And so all five of us have had minor surgeries done by Brianna. And the most common one are when splinters are in our fingers. And she has this little kit. Like she has a splinter removing like with a little pin and the tweezers. And she has this spot. And so we'll go there, and we'll just hand over the finger or whatever, and Brianna, she'll just begin to dig away, right? like a good doctor would. And she just, oh, it hurts. Well, just, you know, bite this stick type of deal. And so, <laughs> and so if you've ever dug out a splinter now, you know that you cannot just dig out half the splinter. Like if you dig out half the splinter going, there, I got half it, it is no good. The splinter is only removed when it's completely gone. The finger is only healed when it's, like if you remove half the splinter, leave half it in there, the infection still happens. But sometimes you get that last bit of the splinter, man, she's got to dig in there. She's got to get those tweezers and it hurts and it's painful, but the small amount of pain to endure then is better than leaving it in there and letting it fester. It's the same with sin and evil. Man, it's going to require, man, it's going to be difficult. I've got to cut this out. I've got to acknowledge this. I've got to go before them and apologize. I've got to say I was wrong. Oh, man, I don't want to do that. But if you leave it in there, all of a sudden it begins to fester and it begins to spread. Cut out, dig away the things that you know you need to dig away. Then you'll understand God's plan and purpose for your life. Then you'll understand am I on the right path or am I on the wrong path? Because when you search after a holy God, you've got to get rid of the sin in your life. That's so easily, easily things. You've got to trust him wholly. Right, going, God, if you don't show up, I'm going to fall flat on my face. Search my heart, God. Point at anything in me that offends you. I'm going to walk in your ways. Then all of a sudden, you'll wind up 10, 20, 30, 40 years down. And all of a sudden, you're going, this was the right path. Not because of my wisdom, not because of my skill set, but because I fell on my face before a holy God. Because I trusted him wholeheartedly. Because I searched his will in every area of my life. And I walked in his ways. I'm going to finish with this. And it's a prayer that I would love for us to have in our lives this week. And it's out of Psalm 119. Now we don't really know exactly who wrote Psalm 119. Many people think it was David, but we don't know. But what's interesting about Psalm 119, it's a super long chapter. And it's broken up uh, as an acrostic by the Hebrew alphabet. And so it's 22 sections based off the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And this section we're going to look at is the fifth letter. And I just want you to read this and, and let this be a prayer for our lives tonight. And here's what the psalmist writes. Teach me your decrees, O Lord. I will keep them to the end. Give me understanding and I will obey your instructions. I will put them into practice with all my heart. Make me walk along the path of your commands, for that is where my happiness is found. Give me an eagerness for your laws rather than a love for money. Turn my eyes from worthless things and give me life through your word. Reassure me of your promise made to those who fear you. Help me abandon my shameful ways, for your regulations are good. I long to obey your commandments. 
Renew my life with your goodness. Let me pray for us. Father, I pray for the individuals in this room and watching online. Don't know what they're struggling with. Don't know where they're spinning around in life. But Lord, my prayer right here and right now is that your way would be revealed to them, that the path that they should walk on would be revealed to them, that the question they've been wrestling with would become so crystal clear because they've trusted in you and they've searched you in every area of their life. And so I would just ask that you would take a moment, either here in this room or, or, or watching online, and just begin to allow God to go, God, search my heart. God, if, if there's an area in my life where I think I can make it happen myself, God, I'm surrendering that to you. I release my control to you. God, if you don't show up, I don't know what's going to happen. And for those of you that are watching, I don't know what your story of faith is, but there is a right path and a wrong path when it comes to eternity. The wrong path ends in eternity in hell. And the right path ends in eternity in heaven. If you're not sure which one you're on, the good news is today you can know. Because the only way to make it on that path into heaven is to place your faith in Jesus Christ. And what happened on the cross and the fact that he died for your sins, he buried, he came back to life. If you place your faith and your trust in him, the Bible says you will be saved. If you're ready to trust in Jesus, just say something like this. Just say, today, Jesus, I trust you. I place my faith in you for the forgiveness of my sins. Please fill me with your spirit. Teach me from your word and help me to live for you from this day forward. Thank you for my salvation. Father, I pray for all of us. Don't know what we're going through, what we're struggling with, but Lord, my prayer is that tonight we'd reconnect with our Heavenly Father, the creator of the universe, that we would see life through the lens that you want us to, God, not through our own lens, not through our own skill set, but through the lens of our Heavenly Father, that tonight we would trust you completely, we'd search you with every area of our life, and we'd walk in your ways. In Jesus' name we pray.